Hey Freaks, it's the 28th of February, podcast number 61. Hey Freaks, how are you? This is Bob. And Jenna. And we're back again for another edition of Vegan Freak Radio. This week we're at show number 61. Wow. I know. Cool. When we when we started this thing way back when, I never thought we would go this long. Nope. Especially because you didn't like podcasting. <laughs> I know, but I've come around to you it. You have indeed. So We've got a very full show this week, I think. Yes, I think so. So we should get moving here. Okay, we have a few, some people to thank. Uh, we need to thank Mike and John at Soy Candles by Phoebes who send us some candles. They smell Uh, really nice. They smell amazing. They're very strong. Um, And they have a website. Strong, good strong. Yeah, soycandlesbyphoebs.com. And you can go take a peek. And they're all soy candles, and the company is run by vegans. Yay! And um, they're just very simple and very pretty. They come they in are. a nice glass jar, and they're, they're very simple soy candles, and they smell wonderful. So They're very nice. And they've got amazing number of scents, and they do them like in their house, and they send them out. And they're, they're reasonably priced. And Are you advertising for them? <laughs> I sound like I am, don't I? We're not getting paid <laughs> for this. We're not getting paid for this. <laughs> Although we did get free candles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't mention that. But no. Um, you know, if they stunk, I wouldn't be, you know, saying all this good stuff about them. True. So <laughs> they don't stink. They smell look. They smell good. Cool. <laughs> so yeah. So I'm just gonna uh, plug that. And they also have a site called PodcastSoup.net, um, ah. where they link to and summarize a lot of different podcasts. So perhaps if you're not sure what a podcast is about, or you want to check it out, or if you missed an episode, and you how would they not be sure it? what a podcast is about? They're listening to one. Huh? Like you mean podcasts no, in general or specific? In general, one? they they go through. They have like a whole series of podcasts that, that they listen to regularly and then oh, summarize on their site. Oh, I understand. Uh, okay, I'm sorry, I wasn't being clear. I didn't understand. I didn't go to the site. Okay, so um, so yeah, so if you know you want to check out the the podcasts that, that that they link to and that they realize, go to it. Okay. Okay. Um. We also want to mention Veronica from Spain. Um, we've talked about her work before. She's an artist. She has a an event happening, she says. It's called Ni Musculos Ni Secreciones, which means neither muscles nor secretions. Secreciones. Oh, sorry. Secreciones. <laughs> <laughs> put on my Spanish accent there. Okay. Well, it is in Spain, right? Yes. It is in Madrid this May 2007, and more than 15 vegan artists from the UK, US, and Spain will be showing artwork for a week at an empty flat located at the heart of the city. And she said the idea behind the event is to promote veganism and respect for non-human animals. And it's she talks about how the art exhibition is an original way of doing vegan outreach. Uh, so if you're interested, you should check out her site, and it's nimusculosnisecreciones.com, and we'll put that link of course in our show notes in case you're not sure how to spell that and (laughs) check it out and if you're in europe go visit absolutely may 2007 they're gonna have a new we should go oh that would be wonderful (laughs) let's go that would be awesome uh yeah anyway so (laughs) yeah they're having a um uh you know an opening and all that and you can find out about it all on the web on the web (laughs) the w3 yes is that what you (laughs) <laughs> Hip kids are calling it these days a W3. Okay, cool. So, um, interesting week on the web it's been, I think. Interesting yeah. week out in, the, out in podcast, vegan podcast land. Uh, Eric Marcus and Gary Francione had a debate on Eric's diner not long ago. And I want to say before, I would have prefaced my comments uh, about this debate and some of the things I want to say about the debate, just simply by saying that Eric and I, um, I, I respect Eric a great deal. He's a friend of mine. Um, and we talked a, a long time ago, we agreed that politically we may not get along, but that we would always try to remain friendly through it. And I would like for that to be the case, because politically it is clear we do not agree. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> on, on a number of things. So I have a lot of respect for Eric, and uh, he has done, I know he has done a lot for veganism. He goes around the country giving talks. He's uh, very hardworking. I think he's one of the m- most hardworking men in veganism. He he would travel around and give very compelling speeches on college campuses and at fairs and all this other stuff. So I think Eric has done a really nice job for promoting parts of the cause. Um, however, I want to talk about his debate with Gary Francione. 
Uh, the two of them discussed quite a lot in the debate, and really, you know, it was two and a half hours. So if you want to know what was going on in the debate, you should go listen to it. I, I don't really want to summarize the whole debate. Instead, I want to talk about a couple things where I thought I might be able to shed some light. I mean, what do you think of that? Okay. One of those things, they kept going back and forth about this whole issue of battery cage eggs versus, uh, you know, cage-free eggs. And they kept coming back to this Humane Society of the United States campaign where the Humane Society was trying to get college campuses to switch their entire food service operations over to battery cage free eggs. And, um, you know, and, and when they were going back and forth about this, Eric brought up this point where he was talking about how, you know, to do vegan outreach, you could go out and you could hand out pamphlets, you could spend all this time putting them together, all this vegan literature, and you could spend hours and hours and hours doing this. And, you know, maybe only a tiny percentage of the people would do that. And he kind of followed this theme through. And I just want to play for you what he said, and then kind of have a I want to talk about what he said and my own experience with this. So here we go. You've just spent 100 hours passing out pamphlets at, at the university, and you know that 98% of the people who get these pamphlets, even in spite of how hard you've worked, 98% of the people are going to keep on eating meat and eggs. It's just, you, you know that's going to, how it's going to be. So if you're willing to spend a hundred hours at a university and you know that 98 percent of your outreach is not in impacting the students there that 98 percent of them are not going to make significant changes why not then add on to your hundred hours that you just spent why not add 10 15 20 minutes to get the dining hall coordinator on the phone and say hey I'm a student of this university. I'm a graduate of this university, whatever. Um, let me send you some information about battery cage eggs. Let, let me, you know, let's start a dialogue about switching your cafeteria away from battery cage eggs. Okay. Um, that's an interesting idea because he says, he, he says, look, you're spending 100 hours handing out literature. It takes time to print the literature. It takes time to hand it out. Only 2% of people are ever going to really be interested in it. And, you know, 15 or 20 minutes, you can call the cafeteria and have them switch over to cage-free eggs. Uh, I think that that is stunningly simplistic when it comes down to it. And I know it is, in fact, because I had students, a group of students at St. Lawrence University, who tried to do this. They were very much interested in, in getting our school cafeteria to switch over to cage-free eggs. And I know the following, because I talked to them about it. It took them hours of meeting with people, hours of meeting with administrators, getting the runaround, getting the kind of shove off. And if you have ever worked in higher education or been in higher education, you probably know this familiar facet of, of, of the college administrator. It is that when students are demanding something, if it, the demand isn't all that particularly strong uh, and it's a spring semester, you can do almost anything you want. You can just say, yeah, yeah, we'll think about it. We'll consider it. And then summer comes, everybody goes away, they go over to the beach or wherever, and they come back in the fall, and suddenly there's this great amnesia that washes over them, and the, the cause is never pursued again. Um, so my students didn't get anywhere. You know, we're talking about hours of meetings with, with members of the administration in trying to get this thing through. So, you know, 15 or 20 minutes to get them to think about it is a little on the short side. I think it makes it sound a little too simple. Uh, the other thing is, is that, you know, there's this whole issue of, you know, feeling a little ambivalent about helping the humane society facilitate the consumption of eggs. I mean, if you are opposed to animal cruelty, uh, it feels weird to be in a situation where you are, in fact, handing off information from the humane society about a company like Radlow Foods, go look them up on the web, from a company like Radlow Foods, to your dining staff, you know, it's like here, this is information about eggs and you're talking about the marginal cost. You're talking about the, the ability to get the eggs in food service quantities, you know, already, uh, already prepared and all things like that. So you get into the situation where you're facilitating the consumption of eggs. And if you're concerned about stopping the consumption of eggs, you're in a situation where you're promoting that. That to me is contradictory. Extremely. Yeah, at I its mean, core. You're asking people, here, eat eggs. You're telling people, yeah, I'm going to make it easier for you to eat the eggs. Yeah. I'm going to make you feel better about eating these eggs. And you're still treating them like a commodity. Cause like you said. The animals. Yeah. The animals, the eggs, they're all commodities because they're just these things out there that, oh, well, they won't cost that much more. You know? You're well, that's talking it. about them in terms of all these prices and all that kind of stuff. That's it. Mm -hmm. The Humane Society gives you the information. They say, well, you know, it might be one, I don't remember the exact numbers, one or two pennies more an egg or something like that, right? Uh, you know, a tiny bit more per egg. So it's not that big of a of not that big of an impact, you know, economically. Uh -huh. um, but even if we leave that aside, I even if we leave aside all the kind of philosophical 
problems I have with this. There is the issue of it taking a lot of time. It took my students hours and hours to not only prepare for these meetings with with administrators to go in looking like they were intelligent and knew what they were talking about, but it took them hours to meet with people to get dressed to look nice. All that it took a lo- it took them a very long time. Uh, here's what took a, le- a lot less time actually. What took a lot less time was me getting on my email and emailing the dining hall coordinator a few times asking for vegan options in the dining hall. It took me two or three emails, you know, over the course of time to get more and more options in there. And I kept emailing and asking for labels. So I went to the dining hall recently and guess what? There are vegan and vegetarian labels on things. Now, that may sound minor. You may think, oh, big deal. You know, it's just some, some vegan food in the cafeteria. It's just a couple labels. You know, don't pat yourself on the back too hard there, Bob. But I think it makes a difference. And I think it makes a difference for the following reason. When students are walking into that cafeteria, we have one really main cafeteria at school. They're walking in there and they're seeing these labels that say vegan on them. It makes the, the term seem a little normal to them. If every mealtime they go in and they see the word vegan on, and it's attached to food that looks appetizing, and sometimes the food does look appetizing, they begin to think, wow, this is vegan food. So I think that has a real impact on students. If, if in fact, your vegan outreach is convincing them to go vegan or even convincing them just for a second to think about it, and then they go to the dining hall and there's that extra little push saying to them, hey, this is vegan food. You might think about this. Mm-hmm. That is important. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that took a total of about 15 minutes of my time. And what we have, another thing that came out of it that students told me was that uh, they made these vegan muffins. And they had this big sign, vegan muffins over them, right? And I heard students in my classes, independent of knowing I was a mm-hmm. vegan, you know, talking and saying, did you try those vegan muffins? And the one, one kid's like, yeah, they're better than the regular muffins. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I had, I had a student come up to me too. He knew I was vegan. He's right. like, hey, I tried these vegan muffins that they had in, in the cafeteria and they were good. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so. <laughs> it's easy to underestimate. Uh, it's easy to underestimate how important this is actually. Mm-hmm. But making vegan food... Um, available and making it seem common, it, it kind of creates this, ah, vegan moment for yes. the students who are thinking about it. And, uh, you know, it, they see the vegan food. And then if they're thinking about going vegan and they see the vegan food in the, in the cafeteria, they have this moment of connection where they go, shit, I want to be vegan. And I could be vegan right. because there's the food I could eat. Exactly. There's something for me to eat in the cafeteria. Exactly. I'm not going to starve. That little bit, 15 minutes, mm-hmm. does a lot for veganism. Yep. And it does a lot to help students it's, I'm not saying that's all we should do. I'm just saying it's one small thing that really does take 15 minutes that can really help those students that are thinking about going vegan. And the point, the point I'm trying to get at here is that um, something as simple as labeling vegan food, I think it can make a big impact. Something as simple as just asking them to get more vegan options in the dining hall can make a big, uh, a big impact. Right, and it's a much better use of the student's time and of your time than trying to get them to eat eggs. I agree. And, mm-hmm. you know, it gets right at the heart of the issue. It's about veganism. It's Mm -hmm. about not participating in the consumption of animal products. Exactly. That's what we're after as vegans. Yep. Not participating at all. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I just, I I have to say, eating eggs is not vegan. Yay, it works. (laughs) (laughs) It's not ot vegan. (laughs) (laughs) Or it's ot vegan. (laughs) But another thing, I, I, and I actually have, you know, it's anecdotal. It's one or two students, but one student recently emailed me and said, you know, I read your book and I was thinking about going vegan, but I thought it seemed too hard and all this other stuff. And he said, you know, but I, I went to the cafeteria, I, saw, I started to see that there were vegan options. And I started to just, it occurred to me that I was just being too easy on myself. You know, I was just like being, I was coming up with all these fake excuses. There was food there to eat. There were options in the dining halls and that there was no reason I shouldn't be vegan. So he went vegan. Yeah. So I think that that <laughs> makes yeah. a difference. And I think we shouldn't underestimate the difference that makes. And I think We shouldn't also underestimate how difficult it is to get large institutions to change. Yes. And the other thing, you know, we, the other thing about this, this egg campaign is that it provides a PR win for the, for the Humane Society. It provides Mm -hmm. a PR win for the university. I'm not so sure it provides a real win for animals in the end. Not at all. Even if, even if we take, well, I'm not even going to go there because they talked about it over and over on the debate. So if, uh, you know, you should probably just go listen to the debate. Mm-hmm. But uh, something else about that, um, the segment that I wanted to address was that he makes it sound like leafleting is the only way to get a, get new vegans. That's right. And, you know, you spend... <laughs> to get new vegans. You could have se- two <laughs> vegans could have sex okay. and half yeah, a well, vegan that, baby. That, that works for creating new vegans, too. Um, but... <laughs> it's probably a lot more fun. <laughs> I, I would prefer just the act of trying. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Um, but anyway, it, it's 
to me, leafleting, yes, okay, it does take a lot of time and probably reaches a very small percentage of people. And I, I know agree with that, that. Um, some people do have some successes with leafleting, and that's, that's right. great. Um, but it's only one of many outreach options. That's right. There are so many different things, and we talk about this all the time on our show, that there are definitely so many ways that you can participate in vegan outreach just by being vegan. You can talk to your friends, you can make them food, you can you know, normalize the vegan for your, right. the people in your life around you. You know, you can do new types of activism. Show film. Art shows. You can do show films. You can, you know, create a zine. Yep. You can do all of these things that do reach a lot of people. Do things on the internet, create new vegetarian groups. That's right. You know. Bring in a hardcore band. Yeah. And give out literature at the beginning of it. Exactly. Free admission. Yep. And, you know, a lot of colleges will pay for those kinds of things mm-hmm. because they want to have alcohol-free activity. Ah, yes. So these are things you can do, I think, <laughs> mm-hmm. at a college level. And I do think that col- that colleges are ripe for talking to people about veganism because I think that's a period in most students' lives when they're willing to con- to, to contemplate and question things. Mm-hmm. Not all of them, but no. but enough. Some. Indeed. It was certainly like that for me. All right, I want to keep moving on okay, here. Okay, go ahead. Um, because I don't want to spend the whole show doing this. I mean, you know, Eric and uh, Francie and I went for two and a half hours. Right. Uh, all right, so... The debate between Eric Marcus and Gary Francione is worth listening to. Uh, you know, I, I, I think Francione presented a very compelling case during the show. Mm-hmm. And I, I feel that Eric presented a less compelling case uh, in general. So I'll put it that way. Um, I think my guess is that, uh, you know, Eric may have felt that way as well, because later on he called in the Humane Society of the United States Cavalry to kind of back him up a little bit. Uh, and that, in that he had a, you know, that same day, his, the first two segments of this interview with Francie Omer out, he called in Paul Shapiro. And Paul Shapiro, um, well, I, he's director of, oh, I forget, they say it in the interview. I should have written it down. But anyway, he's, he's affiliated with Humane Society. I think he's, he's ah, fuck it. I'm not even going to guess because I don't want to get it wrong and get yelled at and be accused of whatever I'll be accused of. Uh, but anyway, I, when, when uh, Eric was talking with Paul, he said the following, and I just want to play this because I think it's worth discussing this. So listen up. Uh, now, uh, I, I happened to talk to your uh, colleague, Josh Bulk, who, as you know, is a regular uh, guest on this show, as, uh, as, as you are. Uh, and uh, when I talked to Josh today, he said something to me that, that really struck me, and I sure wish I had come up with this uh, on, on my feet during, during the debate yesterday. And that, that was uh, Josh maintained that, you know, hey, Gary's position that battery cage eggs and cage-free eggs aren't, aren't ethically different in any real way that these, that these battery cage operations were, were really no worse than the cage-free operations, it turns out that that's, that there's somebody else saying that too, and that's the United Egg Producers. Okay, I I just have to say uh, that strikes me as the kind of tactic that we would see with right-wing republicanism. Mm-hmm. It's it, it's, yep. it's a semantic technology, right? Designed to attach. I mean. In cultural studies, they call this articulation, right? Mm-hmm. It's about articulating an ideological concept. But mm-hmm. what you do is if you can attach an idea to a thing, right, or, or two ideas together, you can articulate those ideas. It can help to create kind of an ideological impression of, of what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. So by articulating this notion, well, you know, Gary Francione agrees with the United Egg Producers, it creates this moment where, oh, really? You know, it's like he's with us or he's with the terrorists. Mm-hmm. Which is it? So... Uh, I, I think that that is it's emblematic of of the kind of rhetorical technologies that we see coming out in this era. Mm-hmm. And just like when when Gary and Eric were talking on the show about fundamentalism, it's the same kind of notion. And I think it's a political tactic that is designed to discredit one's enemies unfairly. Exactly, it's reframing the debate in the way you want it to go, and it is such a Republican tactic. They well, do it all the time, and they're brilliant at it. You know, I, but you're right. <laughs> and whole books are written on it, right? Lakoff. Yeah, Lakoff. And, George yeah. Lakoff has written books on it, yep. And the other thing is, is that I, what I think people should realize, I don't know if this is true, I'm guessing. An organization like Humane Society, definitely, I would think, if I were them, and I had that kind of money, and I had campaigns out there that, that involved public opinion, they must have media consultants. 
They must have people who they've hired to deal with these questions. Uh How do we articulate our message? How do we frame our message? How do we seem the most appealing that we can possibly seem? They probably have high pay media consultants out there, these, you know, people who like Frank Luntz or whoever they might be, who are framing this debate for them, who are giving them this language to feed through the channels so that this kind of perception can be created so that their campaigns aren't harmed. Uh Right. It's a really easy way to kind of just shuttle your enemy off. Into a little, boop, 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 into a little corner, mm-hmm. you know. Yep. And I know you probably will come back and accuse me of doing the same thing for well for new welfareists, right? But here's the thing: these groups are on record as supporting places like Whole Foods. They're on record. I mean, they, there was a letter published in Satya Magazine from Peter Singer and uh, I don't know, fifteen or, or or so different groups. So you know, you can accuse me of saying, yeah. You know, they're, they're shacking up with Whole Foods, but they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can, can anyone produce that same evidence for Gary Francie on the United Egg Producers? Uh, no, because you can't. <laughs> okay, one more thing, and then I want to move on. Um, here's another thing that I think that, that seems to me like kind of a molded dialogue, right? Like a, like a professional media coordinator might come up with. Maybe not. It, this is actually dumb enough that maybe... A professional media coordinator didn't come up with this, but let me play this. Um, this is again from this is from Paul Shapiro himself. So here we go. And my final point that I'd like to make on this uh, on this question is: If people like Gary really believe that reducing animal suffering increases consumption of animals, and I realize they only have a couple anecdotal pieces of evidence to support that, but if they really firmly believe that reducing animal suffering increases consumption of animals, then they should be in favor of increasing animal suffering. If they believe that the amount of animal products that that people consume is based on the amount of cruelty endured by animals, then they should support increasing their misery, making their lives even more torturous. Well, that was an interesting statement that he was clearly reading from something. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, where do we begin with this? Uh, there are so many logical fallacies yes. here. Uh-huh. Uh, what does it do, though? Again, to get back to this whole question of semantic technologies, what does this do? What do you think this does? It makes it sound, of course, like we, we agree with the people like, you know, the United Egg producers. Right, that we want to increase suffering because, you know, clearly that's what we want to do. We want to increase suffering, Right. Mm-hmm. We're the fucked up ones because we want. Right. We right, must right. want increased suffering. Oh, of course. That's must. Yeah, it must be what we want. And it takes the ball off what we really want, which is veganism. Which That's is kind right. of funny because he's arguing against people fighting for veganism, which is just to me, it, it's mind-boggling. Okay. Okay. What <laughs> I think is going on here is that we have misplaced causes happening. Yeah. Right. The foundational argument of abolitionism, I think, is that animal exploitation is wrong. Period. Period. Right. That the property status of animals is wrong. That their status as commodities is wrong. Mm-hmm. You know. Period. So, if you argue that decreasing suffering increases consumption, as I have argued in the past, the presumed cause in my case to argue that is that people get more comfortable with happy meat. I know Eric Marcus hates that term because he said so, and I don't usually say it, but now I'm going to say it just to annoy him. Uh, people get more comfortable with these pro- let's happy meat, let's just call it, mm-hmm. right? The products that, that are, say, you know, parts of campaigns of from uh, what we would call new welfareist. Uh, and, you know, I think that people do get more comfortable. Look at Whole Foods. Mm-hmm. Again, I had to keep coming back to Whole Foods. I know that some of you think I, I harp on Whole Foods too much. I should shut the fuck up, but I'm not going to because I think that Whole Foods is a prime example of how a business is built around this entire concept. Yep. So Whole Foods builds a business around this. And John Mackey himself always says, this is a part of our business that is essential for us to remain profitable. So my logic here is that, yes, people do get more comfortable with these products and people who might have given them up are ready, more readily consuming them, mm-hmm. I think. And I've met people who say, you know, hey, I used to be a vegetarian or I used to be a vegan, but, you know, I can get cage-free eggs. Not cage-free. You usually say free-range. Yeah. No one ever releases cage-free. No. I can get free-range eggs now. Okay, so that's the argument for decreasing suffering increases consumption. But Shapiro then seems to argue that if we really believe that decreasing suffering increases consumption, that we should want to increase suffering. So think about that. That's not the case. Did I say that correctly? Mm-hmm. Okay, good. Because there's a lot of increase, decrease in there. Yeah, right, right. Uh, that's not the case at all. What we want to do is that we want to end all suffering. So we could only assume that the logic that he has, right, would make sense if, in fact, we were operating from a logic where the means justified the ends. Mm-hmm. Wait, where the end justified the means. 
right? Right. Sorry, I'm, I'm confusing myself here. <laughs> where the end justified the means. So what, what instead we are arguing, or what instead I, I would argue, in fact, is that the means and the ends matter, and that you can't get abolition by simultaneously reifying the condition of animals as exploited chattel property, right? You right. can't. So what I'm saying is, is that getting to that end of getting rid of animals as property, the means matter. And, Definitely. And I would argue that you can't fight to end speciesism with species as means. And as long as you're reifying the property status of animals, as long as you're saying, you know, hey, it's okay to consume battery cage free eggs or whatever, you know, uh, you are, in fact, supporting reifying the condition of animals as property and as, a, as commodities. And I think you're shooting yourself in the foot because you're simultaneously saying it's okay to do this. And then you turn your head and say, you know, I think people should be vegan too. Well, which is it? So the kind of argument that Shapiro is making, I think, you know, is, is this argument that really only makes sense in the context of him. If you can, if you can believe that the end justifies any means, uh-huh. right? But we don't believe that. Do we? No. Nope. Right. So, am I making sense? Mm-hmm. Okay, good. Uh, so, what I think then is is this kind of argument that Shapiro has going on here is, is really an absurdity. And, uh, you know, if nothing else, right, abolitionists would argue that our means must match our ends if we're going to make any progress at all. That's, in fact, what I would consider to be one of the primary elements of, of, of the kind of thought that I have about this stuff, you know? Yep. I think then that we have one one of two things happening here. Either Shapiro misunderstands what abolitionism is, right? He doesn't understand the logic of abolitionism, or he understands it and he's portraying it in a negative light through these kinds of comments. Mm -hmm. That's what I think we have going on. Definitely. So, you know, I suspect that he understands it Mm -hmm. and that probably some overpriced media consultant at the Humane Society has Mm -hmm. helped him to figure out a way to yep. articulate the message properly. Yep. I mean, you see you see these kinds of arguments happening now with the Republicans and the Democrats. The, oh, yeah. the Democrats are trying to end the war, and so the Republicans are accusing them of being on the side of the terrorists. <laughs> oh, you must want to help the terrorists. You don't want to do good things for Iraq. Because and you, you don't like the troops. Y- yeah, you're, you know, exactly. You're not, you're not going to support the, the troops. troops. And we, and so that's exactly the same tactic as going on here. So. I think so, too. And I, I just, I, I feel like the whole thing, again... It, it only works if you accept a kind of fucked up logic. That's mm-hmm. the only way it ever works. Mm-hmm. And that's not the logic that abolitionists ever use to argue for the abolition of animal slavery. Ever. Nope. Ever. So, you know, I think that when uh, Eric Marcus called in the cavalry there, I, you know, I think that was a little, a little dodgy. It wasn't really a, arguing the merits of the argument. Mm-mm. I don't think. No. I mean, I listened mm-hmm. to all this stuff and I don't. I don't feel like it was arguing anything about really the merits of the argument, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. It, well, you know, there was part of the stuff with Shapiro that was. But I, I think those bits in particular where, you know, we were try, where, where clearly they were trying to construct this other, right, this mm-hmm. other evil opponent that they could fight against, I feel like that was really problematic. And you know what? People may be saying, I read too much into it. I'm an academic. I think too damn much. But guess what? I think I'm right. And if you listen to it, I don't know. If you come to a different conclusion, I, I would be surprised. But to me, this is what it seems like. I think it's emblematic of the politics of our day. Indeed. It is. <sighs> <laughs> that was quite a rant. Yeah, I need, I need a little, <laughs> take a little, a little breath. In. Uh, so anyway, you should go listen to it over at Eric Steiner. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of rants. <laughs> and speaking of the yeah property status of animals and seeing them as objects. Yeah. You want to play the clip? Which about hunting? Oh, right. I forgot about that. <laughs> oh, yeah. So um, this morning, on I, I wake up every morning to public radio. Because I'm a college <laughs> professor. I'm like a liberal. And, and listen, if, if I don't listen to public radio, will I ever know what my colleagues are talking about? All of them listen to public radio. <laughs> every single one of them, always. So if I don't listen to public radio, at least, you know, here and there, mm-hmm. I have no clue what my colleagues are talking about. In fact, they even make reference to, like, fresh air in faculty meetings, okay? <laughs> fresh air. For those of you that are outside the United States, I apologize. I think Terry Gross is annoying. Uh, anyway, I was listening to the radio this morning. They had a report on about deer hunting this year, and I thought I would play a little segment of the report for you. The prize goes to St. Lawrence County, where about 6,400 deer were harvested. That's up from about 5,900 the year before. Harvested. <laughs> <laughs> harvested. Now, I was half asleep this morning in bed 
when I heard that you were in the shower, uh-huh. uh, Molly was in bed too. <laughs> Emmy was downstairs waiting for food. Molly was in bed, and I was just laying there, and I was like half asleep, and I heard harvested. And I was, Fucking harvested! I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was pissed. <laughs> I will give that reporter's name is Brian Man. I'll give him credit. And the rest of it, he does say killed. Okay. He doesn't really euphemize it that way. Uh-huh. Euf- 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 euphemize, yeah. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. It doesn't it didn't sound right to me. Mm. Uh, that sounds like an instrument, doesn't it? Euphonium, isn't there? A- anyway, <laughs> uh, is there such an instrument? Yeah, euphonium. Yeah. Euphom- yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're getting me confused. Okay. I'm tied. <laughs> this is what happens when I spend when I spend a lot of time by myself in the house. I'm on sabbatical, so I, I sit here and I write all day, and I get a little crazy. I mean, I read Mark. I'm, I'm writing a section of my book that's about Marx, and so I get a little caught up in... And you're caffeinated. Oh, I'm uber caffeinated. <laughs> uh, anyway, point is, I was, I was angry by that. He didn't... He wasn't too bad in the rest of the report. Uh, there was another part of the report that I thought I would play for you as well. So here that is. According to the report, there were 16 self-inflicted injuries caused by hunters last year. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I know. Are we becoming what we hate? Self-inflicted. They didn't hurt anybody else. I I cut that part out. (laughs) I think one person was killed. That was 16 in New York State. It seems too low. I, I I kid. I know. I know. I know. Buddhists, I know, the Buddhists are out there right now firing up their word processors or email programs to send me an email. And I don't mean to offend the Buddhists, but the Buddhists are always the ones that complain when I do this stuff. <laughs> I always get the email, I'm a Buddhist. And it begins like that. You know, it's like, I live a life of compassion and non-judgmental being. And then it's like four pages of judgment. Yeah. Well. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm not dissing all Buddhists. I think Buddhism is fucking wonderful. Um, you know, I just... The Buddhists that would send me nasty email are the ones I'm dissing. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Woohoo. Uh, that's like David Letterman does that shit. I can't stand that. When he, <laughs> Go ahead, Jenna. Okay. You talk now. I talk now. I've been going too no, long. I'm going I'm to read the other article. Well, we can get to that one in a minute. I can read my article first then. Eclipse about hunting. Yes. Newsweek article. That's what you have next. But I'm going to read the New York Times article because I already have the parts marked. So I can read that first. Okay, so I'm reading this one. Okay, uh, Newsweek this week. I understand now. Well, you you look at me like I'm stupid, but this is not on your outline. I don't know who's going to do what. Okay. Uh, It's there. We can go out of order. It says New York Times article, but it doesn't say Jenna will read that, (laughs) does it? (laughs) No, it just says New York Times article. Well, if you wanted me to talk, my point was, if you wanted me to talk, we could do that article first. Then we'll do that article first. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes, folks, this is Vegan Freak Radio. <laughs> I don't care what big, order we do things in. Home of incredible marital bliss. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, fine. Anyway, this is in today's New York Times, since we're going to do this out of order, so I can read. <laughs> anyway. Um, it, the, the title of the article is, Where Only the Salad is Properly Dressed. Okay, and I think, yeah, and I think I think it was Frippy who wrote to us about that. The article we mentioned like, a week or two ago about the the weird eggs that come from chickens that are slaughtered. Oh yeah, that was disgusting. Um, anyway, and she said basically, if you want to if you want to get angry, read the food section of the New York Times, and I totally agree. Um, okay, anyway, this article, I'm just going to read the very first part of it all all to you. It may be laughable when someone says he gets Penthouse Magazine for the articles. It's no joke when I say I went to Penthouse Executive Club for the steaks. Over the years, I'd read report that this pleasure palace on a stretch of West 45th Street closer to the edge of Manhattan than most diners venture peddled more than one kind of seductive flesh. And I felt obliged, honestly, I did, to check it out, knowing that great food often pops up where you least expect it. You can (laughs) find... Yeah, (laughs) pops up. Yeah. Okay, anyway, you can find bliss in the soulless cradle of a strip mall. Why not the topless clutch of a strip club? And so early this month... Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) I gathered three friends for an initial trip. Dare I call it a maiden voyage to the penthouse club? I almost had. (laughs) Come on. (laughs) How could we not? Do it. Do it. (laughs) Or more specifically to the restaurant Robert's Steakhouse nestled inside it. Oh, it's mine. Yes. We were strangers to such pulchritudinous territory. Now, that's a word you don't see in the... Pulchritudinous. Pulchritudinous. SAT word. Yes, it is. 
uh, pocotudinous territory, less susceptible to the scenery than other men might be, more aroused by the side dishes than the side show, underdressed, overexposed young women in the vestibule by the coat check at the top of the red carpeted stairs up to the restaurant on the stage that many of the restaurant's tables overlooks. Are you hungry? One of these women said, making I like that. (laughs) Hey, can you do that more often? Like that voice? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Making hungry sound like an X-rated word. Ravenous. Hey, that's nice. (laughs) Could you you read a whole story like that? (laughs) Anyway. (laughs) Speechless was more like it. We sat down in a cocktail lounge at the front of the restaurant. Uh, You said cock. I did. (laughs) A beautiful woman claimed the plush armchair opposite mine. She introduced herself. I wasn't sure if I had heard her, cor- her name correctly. Mahogany, I said. Yes, she purred. I was getting my bearings. Mahogany, I asked. Do you, know, do you know where you're going to? She didn't miss a beat, noting the reference, summon- summoning the singer and moving on to another of the Dream Girls hits. I'm coming out, she sang, waving her arms, wiggling her hips. Mahogany, Mahogany and I would get along just fine. She said she was running low on Cabernet. I took the cue and asked if I could buy her a fresh glass. Yes, she said, and you can pour it on my toes. Didn't That's happen. so funny. I was writing about I was writing about fetishes today. Oh yeah, and the foot fetish in particular. Ah, there you in go. a discussion of Marxism. Oh, well, there you go. See, that's an advertisement for an upcoming book. <laughs> go ahead. Anyway, didn't happen. And when one of her sorority sisters sidled up to us to pose a question, not commonly, uh, hold on, <laughs> uttered in a fine dining <laughs> establishment, <laughs> is there anyone I can get naked for? The response was silence. On this visit to Roberts and on subsequent ones, I was derelict in my duty, failing to sample much of what the restaurant had to offer. But the beef I devoured, breathlessly, ecstatically. As it happens, Roberts has some of the very best steaks in New York City. But its it's atmosphere, granted, isn't for everyone and has other shortcomings as well. The men who actually wait on the tables are less attentive and personable than the women who hover around them, and it should be noted vanish quickly if shooed away. The prices of some dishes pumped up to reflect the entertainment on hand might also be called topless. But no matter what your appetite for the saucy spectacle accessorizing these steaks, you'll be turned on by the quality of the plated meat. Yeah. Okay, and they have, I also have to read, and it goes on. Talk oh, about, don't go all the way. Talk about the lap dancers. I'm not going to read that. but <laughs> Don't I did go re- all the way. Uh, ha, ha, I did want to read this one paragraph. Good. Okay, the onion rings are fat and crunchy, and cream and bacon turn a side of Brussels sprouts into something naughty, though not as naughty as the most unusual dessert. It's called a butterly, buttery nipple, and it involves one of the women straddling your lap, tilting your head back, pouring a combination of Baileyish Irish cream and butterscotch snaps down your throat, and squirting Ready Whip into your mouth. It costs twenty dollars in cash. Note to the newspaper's expense auditors: I don't have a receipt. <laughs> wow yeah that's a, a really <laughs> sexist isn't it crazy wow that you frat boy <laughs> <laughs> it's a frat boy's wet dream right there <laughs> i think a frat boy's wet dream involves other frat boys well that too um we actually have probably a frat boy listener i know we do yeah yeah <laughs> well Whatever. But, um, we offend it. We're equal we opportunity offend offenders. Okay. But this is, it just goes to show you, I mean, we're always talking about how, you know, sexism, racism, homophobia, and speciesism are all connected. And this is a perfect example. All oppression. All oppression example. I mean, the women are treated as slabs of meat. I mean, they're, they're referenced to in the same vocabulary as the meat is. I mean, he talks about both the meat and the women in, with sexual references. And it's disgusting. You know, we type... He talks about both of them as seductive flesh, you know, and, and as pulchritudinous. You know, they both are, the meat and the women. Okay? And it's just, this is like Carol Adams' <laughs> material right here. It's like, this it kind is of, the kind of stuff that she talks about in her books. It, uh, it's but, amazing, actually. Just, and the whole, the whole overlap of a steakhouse and then, you know, a strip club. Yeah. It's like the double meat. It's yep. weird. Yep, yep. That's very disturbing. It is very disturbing. And I think. You got the flesh on the plate and then the flesh in your lap later on giving you dessert. Giving you a very not vegan dessert. It is indeed <laughs> not vegan. <laughs> Bailey's and whipped cream. Although I guess you could do it with soya do, right? Yeah. I saw Bailey's, a recipe. Bailey's isn't vegan either. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I saw a recipe for uh, soy ba- uh, like a soy milk Bailey's at some oh, point yeah? somewhere, but I would never make I it. I guess that would be like Irish whiskey. And Sounds disgusting. Um, okay. Whatever. But anyway, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, women as objects, animals as objects. There you go. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm enjoying the sound effects today. <laughs> Sorry, I, it's okay. I, I was a little, I was a little fired up earlier. Yes, I know. Well, it's all the caffeine you fed me before the show. I mean, <laughs> I fed you. you just, yeah, you know, like I had to twist. Did your you arm. not bring an espresso up to me before the show? Because you asked for it. <laughs> no, you said, "Do you want a coffee?" I said, "Uh, yeah." <laughs> Like, if you ever ask me, do you want coffee? And have I ever said, no, I don't think I do. No. It's usually, <laughs> fuck yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> now, uh, another piece of annoying uh, mainstream media. This one, media, I sound a little funny saying that. This one comes from Newsweek. Uh, this is February 26, 2007 issue. And this article is called Eat, Drink, Man, Woman, and Child. And... The byline of the article is, how does marriage work for a tofu-loving vegan and a fish-eye-eating omnivore? Deliciously. (laughs) 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 The first half gets cut out. It's our fucking soundboard. Here, let's see if Not Vegan works. Not Vegan. Not Vegan works this week. The comedy drum fill does not. There There it goes. goes. Okay. Okay, so, um, (laughs) anyway, she, let's see. The, the the author, Jenny Andrews, talks about how, you know, she's a vegan and her husband is a Chinese, Japanese, Hawaiian uh, who, you know, likes his regular products of animal suffering. So, the, you know, the thing talks about this and it talks about, you know, her relationship with her husband and how food kind of intervenes in it. And she write, she writes in the article, our contrasting eating habits weren't an issue when Ken and I started dating. Though I've always been interested in food politics, I've never been a proselytizing sort of vegan. Like, I guess I am. Yeah, of course. Uh, and I've been known to put a little cow milk in my coffee if there's no soy milk. And I'll eat feta in mom's salad rather than hurt her feelings by picking it out when she forgets the vegan rules. What do you think of that? <laughs> Not vegan. <laughs> <laughs> First off, feta? Yeah, Ew. I was going to say, you Not know, vegan. do us all a favor and just fucking call yourself a vegetarian. Yeah. Oh, or you know what? <laughs> Grow a spine and just be like, Mom, I appreciate you making me a salad. It's very kind of you. And I know I know that you put a lot of love into this, but it has cheese on it and I can't eat cheese. Mm -hmm. How hard is that? Right. Actually, I wanted to read since we're talking about that quote. Go ahead. um, I wanted to read this. This had been on on our forums and and one of our uh, forum members, Tomb Reader. Um, says, what the fuck, cow's milk in her coffee eating cheese doesn't sound like she knows what a vegan is. And I've come to the conclusion that eating animal products to spare someone hurt feelings is akin to faking an orgasm. If you're not honest and upfront about what you want, you'll just end up frustrated. <laughs> I thought that was brilliant. It is good. <laughs> so, yeah, I thought that I did that while you were while you're talking about that part. Yeah. yeah. And uh, anyway, she goes on to talk about more stuff in the article. And she says, similarly... Watching my husband eat has taught me to be conscientious about what's on my plate. Ken sees a chicken as a bird, not a disembodied nugget. So he eats birds. That's even worse. He mm-hmm. recognizes. He knows, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's looked behind the veil and he's seen an animal and he's still like, I'm going to eat that fucker. Uh, anyway, he gives thanks for each animal he eats. I'm tired of that one. It's oh, like, yeah. You know, I'm going to eat your baby, Miss, um, Miss Andrews. But before I do, I'm going to give thanks. You know, mm-hmm. thanks to Jenny Andrews for providing me with her small child that I can eat today, and then I'll eat it. <laughs> you know, it's like, what the fuck? Uh, anyway, he gives thanks for each animal he eats and savors every last part of it, sometimes stopping mid-meal to re-season a dish. And while he has no plans to give up meat, Ken is open-minded about my diet and enjoys my favorite vegan recipes and restaurants as much as I do. One day he looked up as we were cooking, grinning and slightly stunned, and blurted out, I don't think I like chili any better with meat than without. There's only one food about which Ken clings to tradition. It has to be white rice, he pleads. I just can't handle that brown rice. So I understand that, you know, people have different relationships with their husbands and wives and, uh, you know, their partners and that they have to come to an understanding about their diets. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I I just wish that if there were going to be a vegan in Newsweek, that she'd be a real vegan. I know. And it's not that hard? No, no, it's not. And the frustration comes from the fact that now, you know, people read this and they're like, oh, vegans sometimes eat cheese. Yeah, I know vegans like, you know, oh, I read Newsweek. The woman eats feta and she's a vegan. She's a vegan. First off, (sighs) feta makes me feel a little ill. Yeah. Like it reminds me of like baby puke writ large Mm -hmm. and it smells really bad. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. 
Yeah. Well, there are two other parts of this article that I wanted to mention. First of all, she says, um, that about five years ago, I became a, vi- a vegan. Today, chili stew and stews and endless vari- uh, variations of salads are my staples. While Ken's diet is more varied, his philosophy is <laughs> yeah. simpler. You know, that is bullshit. It is bullshit. You know? That his diet's more varied. You know, I eat way more things now than I ever did as an Omni. Yeah, me too. Way more. Me too. It's just, yeah. In terms of the different ingredients, too. I exactly. Mean, different kinds of beans and all kinds of things we eat. I know. I only eat beans. I well, so her diet might not be varied because she probably eat chili on every night. <laughs> but that, it, it's annoying because it makes it sound like our diet is deprivation once again. And and she also talks about how they wanted to kill a pig at their child's first birthday because it's tradition. Oh, yeah. And she says above that he he do, you know he clings to tradition with the brown with the white rice. But he the whole article is about how he clings to this tradition and how he wanted to roast a pig on a spit for his child's first birthday. And she says, after initially being initially appalled, I came to appreciate the care taken in this oh, tradition. Yeah. <laughs> I was just like, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, oh, I don't want to be appalled anymore. Well, <laughs> <sighs> what are we going to do when we have vegans out there that can't even recognize the speciesism that's existing in the world? I mean, she's a vegan. Why is she a vegan? I don't know. Maybe we should ask her. Yeah, maybe we should. It'd be, cool. It'd be fun to have her on the show. <laughs> Jenny Andrews. She looks kind of wishy-washy. Mm. The subtitle on her picture is Tofu Anyone? Yeah, because that's all we eat. <laughs> Despite occasional challenges, food is a source of pleasure for my husband and me, not conflict. We learn from our differences. And everybody's warm and fuzzy and happy. Yeah. What do you what do you learn from meteors? I mean, we live with these people all the damn time. They should learn from us. Sure, they should. I'm not trying to say that I'm elitist and better. But I am. No, I'm not trying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to say that. I, I just think, you know, it's like an ethical position. It's a moral position to me. And I think as a moral position, it makes sense. That's all I'm saying. That's why I believe before people send me the nasty emails about how I'm too whatever, right? It's an ethical position like any other ethical position. Violating that ethical position is not right. Not at all. That's the way I look at it. Mm-hmm. It's that simple. It's like, I don't tell racist jokes on occasion. I'm not going to eat meat on occasion. I don't understand why that is so controversial. A couple months ago when I wrote on our blog that I thought it was ridiculous that Peter Singer called himself a vegan and ate cheese, I got so much shit for that. It's like, why do I get so much shit for that? I don't understand. It's a simple ethical principle. Like you say that you're opposed to animal suffering and you participate in it. You are violating your own ethical principles. Mm Mm-hmm. Why? And it's not hard to do. It's not like we, it's not like there are these marginal cases always happening where we have to do this to live because we don't, you know, if we had to do it to live, it'd be very different, but we don't Mm -mm. every single day in this, in, in, in in the country we live in, at least it's not that difficult. (sighs) Yeah. Well, I think it could partially come from the fact that people see it as a diet and not a lifestyle, not an ethical principle. They just say, oh, what's what you eat? It's but, not who you are. But it's so much more than that. It's, agreed. It is an ideological position about the world. It's a political, ideological position. Mm-hmm. I completely agree with you. And and we have to think of it that way. Mm-hmm. Not just as a diet. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Speaking of annoyed vegetarians. Yeah. Oh, why don't I read this email? <laughs> Do you want to read it or should I? You read the original and then we'll each read our responses. Okay. Did I respond first or did you? I think we did it about the same time. Yeah. It was really funny. Our yeah. responses. What time does yours say? Um, two, 128. <laughs> really, mine says 154. Ah. <laughs> so, I remember that they crossed and... Because, uh, well, anyway. Mm. This is from... Uh, well, I won't tell you who it's from. He writes, I'm still like 98% vegan, which I suppose makes me an asshole. Just like Peter Singer, who eats cheese if he is in a social setting where there are not really vegan options. Yes, I agree. That makes him an asshole. <laughs> not the guy writing. Peter Singer, though. Uh, it was funny in the debate. Francie had referred to Peter Singer as our father who art in Princeton. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that debate was amazing. Um, and a little sad. I, I, I listened to part of your program tonight and then just had to turn it off because I find your self-righteous attitude so annoying. Yes, I am self-righteous. Why? You started by saying that being a vegetarian is commendable. Then 20 seconds later, you are arguing that if you are a vegetarian because of animal rights, then it does not do much for animals because of eggs, milk. Let me ask you something. In our world, do you seriously think that when you're a vegan, you're making that much of a difference? At this point in history, what you are doing as a vegan, uh, as a vegan or what we, vegetarian trader assholes, are doing is a symbolic act. And whether you like it or not, vegetarians also show people the path to a more compassionate world. 
And again, at this point in history, when a wide majority of the world population needs me, I personally believe uh, that to get people on our side, showing them that we are so friggin' pure, quote, look at me, I don't eat meat, fish, dairy, eggs, I don't wear leather, wool, so if you want to do something about animals, do the same and stop mixing honey with your lemon tea when you have the flu, it's certainly not the best way. I may be wrong, who the fuck knows, but your whole food is evil attitude is irritating and above all counterproductive. Also, you may want to stop with that attitude towards Peter Singer. He's my daddy. No, um, he may not be a vegan, but hey, you know what he wrote? And that has changed the lifestyle of a shitload of people. You know, what is this? You write one book and you get a pass for the rest of your life. Apparently. It's fucking ridiculous. It's like, this is like, oh, you want to talk about fundamentalism, right? <laughs> Come on. This is what, you know, literal interpreters of the Bible do this. <laughs> right? They say, well, that's the Bible. You know, that's the way it is. We can't critique it. Is this what we're doing with Peter Singer and Animal Liberation? Like, well, that's what he wrote. We can't critique it. I mean, even Marxists, you know, even Marxists can critique Marx now. What the fuck? Yeah. Well, it, it, I don't know. I don't ever understand that people put other people on pedestals and treat them like gods. They are that not can do gods. no wrong, you know? I don't think anybody should do that for anyone. I agree. And you, you might have respect for someone, but you shouldn't ever treat another human being like a god. They're just another human being like you and me and everyone else. You they know have what? They fallacies and That's they're right. valuable and they, they just... They fuck up. They fuck up. Yep. You know what? And they say problematic shit. And they do. And they. <laughs> and I don't see what's wrong with being called on that. I know. I mean, if, if you're Peter Singer and you you have... A philosophical system that can be used to justify the extermination of mentally challenged people. I mean, come on, that deserves critique. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why that's a problem. All right, but let's move on. Okay. What I wrote may have sounded a bit abrupt, but I'm sure you can take it. Oh, I can. <laughs> I definitely can. <laughs> and the fact of the matter is that even though we may disagree on the means, we agree on the end. We may disagree on the means, we, we agree on the end. <laughs> well, we were talking about that earlier. <sighs> so I got that one, and when I was done laughing, because those kinds of emails, actually, I, I don't laugh at them. I just think that people get so angry at us. I know. People get very angry at us. Should I read my response first or should you read? Why don't you read yours and we'll come back. And okay. So, so it's funny because we both decided we were both. Yeah, we know. didn't. We didn't coordinate this. <laughs> no. Jenna was at work <laughs> and I was at home. I was like, all right, I need to get this out. Okay. My response is a little long, but um I said, if you actually, uh, actually listen to the rest of the bit on why you should go vegan, we say that if we, what we talked about made you angry, you should stop and think long and hard about why we touched a nerve. In our book, Vegan Freak, we talk about how vegans are seen as self-righteous and deplorable, even if we don't open our mouths to say anything. Just by existing, just by not eating what you are eating, we trigger something in your brain. We show you that we are, you are doing something that is potentially problematic. We stand in for that animal whose products you are eating. We remind you that there is indeed a connection between the animal and what is on your plate. The simple truth is you can't be a vegetarian for ethical reasons because it is simply logically inconsistent. There is more torture and death in milk and eggs than there is in meat. You can pretend that's not the case, but you're deluding yourself. <laughs> in order for a cow to give milk, she first must be inseminated and then give birth. What do you think happens to that calf? Some of the female calves become dairy cows like their mother. But since the male calf has absolutely no purpose on a dairy farm and cannot be raised for steak because it's the, not the same quality of breeding as beef steers, the calf is killed for veal. When mom is no longer producing as much milk as she used to, she is sent off to become hamburger. She doesn't go to some nice pasture to live out the rest of her life. This is the case from the smallest farms to the largest. So when you eat dairy, you can pretend that you're not participating in the animal's death, but there's actually twice as much death as for meat. The same goes for eggs. Since male chicks cannot produce eggs and aren't as meaty as broiler chickens, they are immediately killed. When the hens are no longer producing as many eggs as they used to, they are killed for low-quality meat. This doesn't even touch on the horrendous conditions under which the dairy cows and egg-laying hens live under and are slaughtered under. I highly recommend that you research this, perhaps reading something like Slaughterhouse by Gail Eisnitz. Do I think vegans make that much more of a difference? Hell yes. I am living by my principles. I am living ethically, completely ethically, with no contradictions. And most importantly, I am showing other people that life without animal products is possible. I am showing that we don't need any animal products to thrive. I am showing that we don't need to treat animals as property or as things for us to use and dispose of. I am showing that they are sentient beings that have their own right to live on their terms. I am living my activism. 
I can't show people these things if I eat cheese once in a while. I can't abolish the use of animals or the perception of animals as property or things if I decide that the occasional egg in a baked good is okay. And that's why we harp on Peter Singer. To you, he may be a god, but to us, he's just another human (laughs) who says some fairly problematic things. He thinks it's okay for other people to eat meat as long as they do it, quote-unquote, humanely. I heartily disagree with that notion. We've argued this with many, many people who think that since the world will never be vegan, we shouldn't even try. We should just get them to eat nicer meat. Well, there's no (laughs) nice death for these animals. Happy meat. Happy meat. (laughs) Getting people to eat humane meat does not get them to stop seeing animals as objects. Our goal is to get the people to understand that they are not objects. They are sentient beings that feel. Even the bees that produce your beloved honey are quite intelligent creatures. Our goal is to promote veganism. We must try to promote the kind of world we want to live in. We can't in good conscience promote anything short of that. If this bothers you, then so be it. You can do your thing and we'll do ours. Very nice response. <laughs> Very nice. I was so angry. <laughs> I can I was, like, feel it up. bubbling underneath the surface there. It's just, it just sounds like it's ready to poke through and say, fuck you. Yep. <laughs> I wasn't really angry uh, when I got this email. I mean, I'm used to this. I know. It's just, I guess I was just like... All right, another one? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) All right, already. Yep. I I wrote back, and mine's somewhat shorter. Yeah. I wrote, I'll ask only this. If my points offended you, they may have struck a nerve. It takes more than the ranting, profanity, and anger that you sent me to really think about the nerve they may have struck. If you're honest with yourself and willing to think about it, I'd ask you to consider that and to think about the logical, compelling reasons that I gave for going vegan. This may require you actually hearing me out, which apparently you were too angry to do. As for veganism, it isn't about purity. It is about living a principle through to its logical conclusion as a moral matter. I've been called a fundamentalist for arguing this, but that's okay. I tend to be a fundamentalist about other moral principles, too, including racism, sexism, and homophobia. Just as I believe that a little of each of those isn't okay, I also don't believe that just a little bit of speciesism is okay. That's why I advocate a fully vegan lifestyle. Anyway, I hope you'll consider your anger and its roots honestly. Perhaps I'm just an asshole, or perhaps I have a point, and there's a part of you that realizes that. (laughs) <laughs> uh, we never heard back. No. He probably deleted them. So fuck around. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. We're going a little long in the tooth here. Are we not? Oh, yeah, but we're almost done. Okay. Um, we don't have any voicemails this time. I mean, we got voicemails, but I... Uh, we're, we're... We get there. We're just like a busy... <laughs> yeah. we got, I got the emails this time, though. We did print about a bunch of those. I didn't so. play the email no, theme song. No, we didn't. We've just been reading emails, but... Oh, yeah. sorry. Right. <laughs> okay, so anyway, um, this email comes from someone named Carl. He says... Carl. Carl. <laughs> hey, Carl. From Aqua Team. <laughs> sorry, Carl. I bet you get that a lot. <laughs> uh, are you from Jersey? No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, On the last show, you were talking about being vegan in different places, including the developing world. I'm here to say that it is very possible and not that difficult to be vegan in strange places. My wife and I are from the U.S., but we work as English teachers in a medium-sized city in eastern China. I get a little bothered when people complain about veganism being inconvenient. If It's not. If we can do it here, you can do it anywhere. Before I came here, I thought it would be simple to be vegan. I imagine lots of rice and vegetables. What could be simpler? When we got here, we were shocked by how voraciously meat is consumed. Meat and animal products are all over the place. You walk down the street and there is bright red bloody meat being sold on the street. Ew. Yeah. It is far more recognizable as pieces of living things than the nicely cleaned packages and, uh, nicely cleaned and packaged meats you see in the Western world. When we go to the grocery store, there are giant tanks filled with fish and other animals right there where you enter the produce department. It always makes me sad to walk by them. There are lots of large fish all crammed together into tiny tanks. Not only that, but when, but there are also tanks filled with crabs, lobsters, frogs, turtles, eels, and shellfish. They all look so sad, especially the turtles. When people buy these animals, they scoop them out of the tank and put them in plastic bags. They, then they suffocate and die in a shopping cart. When we go out to eat, it is hard to find vegan dishes, but it's possible. We mostly cook at home to avoid the frustration involved with trying to explain what we need. I have learned to say... I don't eat meat, eggs, fish, chicken, duck, milk (laughs) in Chinese. I can also ask if a dish has any of those things in it. 
if I can learn to say this shit in Mandarin Chinese, people can say it to servers who speak their own language. Good point. The servers often don't even listen to my questions. I think it's because the concept of veganism is so foreign to them. Everyone we talk to is surprised and perplexed by our eating habits. I think it has to do with the economy. For many years, most people in China could not afford meat. Now that they can, they don't understand why you wouldn't eat meat if you can afford it. In spite of all these problems, I would still tell you it's easy to be vegan. We eat a ton of fresh fruits and vegetables. Fresh produce is plentiful and extremely cheap compared to the West. We buy most of our produce on the street or in a big veggie market near our apartment. This is nice because I like dealing with another individual. I know that what I pay them for my food goes to feed that person and their family, not to a giant agribusiness conglomerate. We did cook at home a lot before we came here, so maybe we were well prepared. We even make our own veggie burgers from scratch. As for veganism being bourgeois, I would disagree with that. I think that veganism has been co-opted by the market in order to sell things to yet another niche market. Absolutely. But the essence of veganism is about fighting against these things. Holy Whoa. shit. <laughs> Mole just moved the entire table. <laughs> like inches. Like eight inches. <laughs> I had to move my whole chair. <laughs> Mole, he's sleeping <laughs> underneath the table here. He is. I have to say where my legs crossed because I can't. There's too much no room under there. <laughs> Go ahead. Anyway. Uh, right. I think that allowing the death of animals to become commo- uh, commoditized. Is that right? Commoditized? Commoditized. Yeah. Commoditized. And sanitized yeah. is far more bourgeois. With the meteoric rise of the market economics in China, the consumption of meat here has exploded. The new bourgeois eat here eat nothing but milk, meat, and eggs. They market the shit out of the stuff here. There are guys I work with who will not eat a vegetable. China's cutthroat capitalism surprised the hell out of me. Anything that can be marketed here is. It's not a matter of convenience. It's not a matter of taste. It's not even about willpower. Those things are temporary. It's about a real understanding of the issues. Sometimes I think it would be more convenient to be an omni, but I could no more eat an animal or cause one to be enslaved than I could kill or enslave a child. Nice. We love the show. Keep up the good work. We've been vegan since January 1st, 2006. We yeah. listened to one episode of your show before deciding to go from vegetarian to vegan. Your show was a major Sweet. factor that influenced our decision. Carl and Marie Smith, Cobol Aquarius on the forums. Well, thanks That's so awesome. much. <laughs> that is so cool. Yeah. And that was an excellent, excellent email. It was indeed. And we were very happy to hear that. We make a lot of good points. And I think, I mean, in place like China, from what I understand of the sure. situation, is that people associate the you know the vegan diet with poor people right and so when economies move on right like they are that you know like you said people now want to eat the things that aren't associated with that oh hey look i can afford meat i'm going to eat it now sure so absolutely yeah, i think that does happen but if you if you read any of the you know kind of health literature around these issues you can see that as people switch mm-hmm. from the more traditional diets into the more western meat centered fat centered diets there's increases in diabetes, there are increases in cancer, there's increases in heart disease, and populations that traditionally didn't have these things now have them. Yep. So you yep. could see that shift happening. Definitely. It's sad. Yeah. The China study actually looks yeah. at that a lot. It looks at different parts of China that have different diets depending on how, you know, westernized or how um, much they've, they've grown with the economy. So if you're interested, you should take give that a read. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, oh, we have one more email. Do we not? Or yes, two? One more. That's it. One more. This one is from Tessa. And Tessa says that, uh, Dear Bob and Jenna, I'm not sure if I'm too late, but I wanted to nominate Seba Johnson as an angel. If you've never heard of her, she was the youngest alpine ski racer in history and a vegan since birth. Seba was disqualified from a World Cup ski race because she refused to wear a ski suit with a patch of leather sewn onto it. Wow. <laughs> She's a wonderful inspiration for animal rights activists everywhere. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I man. didn't know anything about her. Me either. Well, we should go. We, I should have done the research before yeah, the show, I but <laughs> I could have told everybody all about her. And now I, I did. That's pretty cool. I mean, that some is. people would call her fundamentalist for that, but <laughs> she's being consistent. Uh, <laughs> consistency. Yes. Uh, do we have anything else? Uh, I don't know. Do you want to do any of these? Let's do a couple okay. of these. I mean, <laughs> well, and then we're going to close the show. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, Marshall sent us, Marshall Krista. Oh, I guess I shouldn't do his last name. But anyway. Uh, He writes, the site Urban Dictionary, if you're not familiar, uh, is where people submit their own definitions to words. There are a few of the best ones. These are a few of the best ones I found when I searched the word vegan. And they're in no particular order here. So, uh, I don't know. Do you want to just read a couple? Sure. 
Do you want to start with the first one? <laughs> veganism is a militant form of vegetarianism. Vegans are the pe- vegans. Apostrophe, apostrophe yes. S. Yeah. Okay. Are the people you'll see eating some of the most unhealthy junk at a health food store. That's actually true. That's actually, yeah, true. <laughs> 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 I've known vegetarians that grow their own vegetables. I know. <laughs> By the way, cupcake is not a food category. Not a food group. I've known those who eat meat tended to grow their own veggies also. Then again, I live in, I'm assuming that's supposed to be Oklahoma, peak Oklahoma. Oh. Oh, hey. Hey, don't do that. He's chewing on the studio. <laughs> <laughs> Just decided to gnaw on the table. Go ahead. Uh, he, anyway, she, veganism isn't an adequate diet, and many American physicians tell people, tell people only to go to... Just not read tight. it. Vegetarian ve- veganism. If you're planning on using supplements to get the other much-needed nutrition in your diet, that's not true. Just B12, and that's uh, only because animals animals get it from microorganisms. Yes. They don't produce it themselves. Anyway, never listen ahead. to vegans themselves who think they know your lifestyle. If your job requires physical labor, the yeah, veganism won't provide much. Oh yeah, we're all weak. Just like Saba Johnson, who's a skier professional. Uh-huh. Okay, anyway. Uh, here's another one. A person who can't stand the fact that people eat meat, ignoring the fact that we've been eating meat since the beginning of time. These people are usually self-righteous, R-I-G-H-T-O-U-S-E, sons, apostrophe, of bitches, B-I-T-C-H-E, apostrophe, S, <laughs> who will refuse to, T-O-O, eat, wear, use any animal products. They eat lots of grain, and in order to get this grain, they must plow it. And in the process of plowing, they kill hundreds of field mice, F-E-I-L-D, F-E-I-L-D, mm-hmm. yes. I learned I before E when I was mm-hmm. in like second Except grade. Yep. Uh, yeah, field mice, rabbits, and other poor defenseless creatures all for grain. But when a cow is killed, God help us all, a cow has been killed for the sake of feeding families. F A M I L Y apostrophe S. Oh snap, the agony. Yup, a quick painless death. And then they eat the meat too, the non vegans that is. How dreadful. But don't worry, the field mice getting plowed is a fun death. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've all heard that before. That one's so old. Yeah, really. Let's see. Want to do another one? A person who avoids all meat and animal products such as milk, eggs, or leather. Usually total pussy. Who is How just trying to one? be a part of some cause or lifestyle because they have nothing else better to do. A typical vegan is stupid and ugly oh, yeah. and sports a meat is murder shirt. <laughs> uh, here's another one. A person who avoids all meat, all meats and animal products such as milk, eggs, or leather. Usually, Oh, yeah, that's one you just read. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did you read this one? Vegan diets ruin human fetuses and vegan parents ruin, ruin human lives. Oh. Okay, yeah. Real life example of vegan. A vegan chick who works at Starbucks bought and ate plain bagels every day. The dumbass didn't know that the bagels she was eating every day contained eggs. She finally finds out and says, I didn't know they used egg to make bagels. See, typical vegan retard. Since vegans don't like animals being slaughtered for my burgers, we should start slaughtering vegans and making my burgers out of them. Oh, yeah, that's great. Uh, here's another one. A person who doesn't consume animal products. They are un-American, probably communist. <laughs> and in the case of the male vegan, most likely a homosexual. That vegan guy goes to the bathhouse too much is probably the usage he came up mm-hmm. with. Uh, <laughs> Enough of this bullshit. These are funny. Ugh. Here's another one. A person that chooses to eat vegetables because they're easier to catch. <laughs> uh, you don't like this, do you? <laughs> no. Vegan. One who clings to an absurd, phony ethic that is wholly unsupported. Vegans are, almost without exception, juvenile, whiny, soppy, clueless urbanites. They always start by claiming to live a cruelty-free lifestyle until the horrible flaw in their own claim is pointed out to them. Namely, that tens of thousands of animals are killed in producing the supermarket veggies they happily shovel into their big, fat, gaping pie holes. <laughs> I think it's funny. You get uh, mad. I just think it's, I just think it's funny. Well, it's because these idiots think they're like, they're the first person to come up with this shit. Well, of course they know? think that, but, you know. And they're just so original and so smart. We're in a different place in the room now than when we started I know the show. We are. <laughs> I feel I'm we're like, like a foot away <laughs> from the equipment now. Molly's been pushing the, the the table that the studio is set up on across the floor. He's a very very strong dog. He is very strong. Very strong dog. Okay, I think we're. <laughs> oh, we wanted to share a funny story about Molly. We did. We <laughs> we were sitting there eating lunch. We had a, a humongous <laughs> salad for yeah. lunch, and you know, Molly sat there the entire time I was making it, so he ate some of the carrot pieces, right. of course. And you know, we are eating at the table, and he's sitting down there, and he's laying, you know, just laying on the floor, going, "Her." He does that. Her. Oh, he's moving the table further. <laughs> we're gonna run out of cable soon. Her. <laughs> anyway, so he's basically he's begging Her. for salad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell that he's the dog of vegans because he's sitting there begging for salad. Right, Mole? 
Yeah, he wagged his tail <laughs> when I said that. <laughs> He's right here. <laughs> Molly, let's see if we can get him to do his little trick. Molly, Republicans. Republicans. Molly, Republicans. Oh, he won't do He's it. Like, you don't have a biscuit. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> Republicans. 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 Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there he goes. <laughs> Molly, Republicans. Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. All right. That's uh, it. We're yeah. done. One other final announcement before you sign off. Um, we have to we're, we we have to move our podcast site. Uh, so you shouldn't notice any differences. Okay. Everything should just automatically redirect and forward and everything. But if you don't hear from us in like a week, week and a half, come check. Okay. We're going to be at veganfreakradio.com. So we need to move to that new site. Uh, and if you don't hear from us, suddenly your feed doesn't update for some reason, come check veganfreakradio.com and make sure your feed's working. But it should all work. If you're on, anybody who's on iTunes, it should automatically just update everything. And subscribers, everything will be fine for you. Nothing's going to change. But for those of you that are subscribed via iTunes, it should automatically update the feed to the new address and everything. But we're going to have to move. So I wanted to give everybody a heads up. Okay. Okay. And tomorrow is a new month. Please vote for us at Podcast Alley. We did pretty well this month. I think the last I checked, we were number 22. That's good. That's very good for us. We could us. do better, though. Yeah. I mean, we have a lot of listeners, and they, yeah. we would like for you to do that, yes. to vote for us. I know another thing you could do is tell a friend. <laughs> tell a friend about Vegan Freak Radio. Say, you know, friend, listen to the show, Vegan Freak Radio. Bob's an asshole, and you have to listen to it. <laughs> Well, thank you once again for listening. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, podcast I, uh, at veganfreak.com for now. For, n- <laughs> for now. Uh, soon we'll podcast at veganfreakradio.com, I guess, will work as well. Right. So uh, I'll have that going soon. 267 uh, That will always work. Our voicemail line. I hope it'll always work. Mm. Um, come to our forums. Now people can comment on the forums without being registered on the forums. Uh, about the, the podcast. podcast. Yep, and registration will reopen tomorrow anyway. So. There you go. Okay. So that's about it. And uh, we'll be in touch with you next week. Be in touch with us in the interim. Stay vegan, stay happy. Bye. Bye. Let's go.